Hi, BG. How you doing? Hi, Hi Monica. How are you? I'm doing okay. It's uh, we're filming this September in September, and the weather's been just gorgeous. Oh, yeah, so I've been pretty, very happy. It's a lot cool easier to walk outside with a mask on in this weather than the weather we had in July. So I'm just fine with it. Yeah. So you doing okay? I'm doing good. Yeah. I'm doing good. This is going to be a fun one. I think. Oh, super excited about it. Super lots of, excited. Lots of about different it. personalities and. and um, it's the stories. I mean, I'm just excited oh, to yeah. hear. Yeah, yeah. I'm just, I'm just gonna sit back and listen to some of it. Um, but yeah, we've got um, Jim White, who is a, a, a great friend of ours. We've, you've, you've known Jim how long? Oh gosh, um, since the whatever time he came to. Nashville mm -hmm. in the eighties or something. I'm not sure. He'll have to clarify the date on that yeah, one. Yeah. So, and, and Roger, of course, you've known him since, uh, the, he, <laughs> since, as, as since he worked with Peggy Lee in 1892. Yeah. So. Uh, Joy Behar always says, uh, yeah, I've known him since like dinosaurs walked on the earth. <laughs> <laughs> so, it feels like that sometimes. I always tell everybody that Roger is one of my brothers. I'm an only yeah. child, but I've got good brothers, all yeah. kinds of, yeah, and all kinds of cousins like Jack, uh, Jim. And yeah. Once you're in the band, you're in the band, you know. That's right. Part of the village, I always like yeah. to say. Yeah. Good to have a village. And I'm excited because we're all, I think, meeting Bill Crow for the first time tonight. Yeah, and yeah. Bill is, um, my goodness, he, he's worked with everyone, you name it, Jerry Mulligan, Stan Getz, Milt Jackson. I'm, I'm getting a little nervous and starstruck just <laughs> saying these names. Marion McPartland, your friend Marion McPartland. Yeah. And um, he's written- I got to three... work with him one time. At, at a Columbia, oh, that's right. That's Columbia, right. South Carolina Jazz Festival. And they, they put us in a, uh, a small restaurant, but they brought in a piano and um, we had a really good rhythm section and big crowd and everything. And it was wonderful. That was, gosh, 20 some years ago, or 30, more like 30 almost. Well, he's, he's a, a, a wonderful bassist. He plays a lot of different instruments, but uh, he's also written three very successful books. And I think mm -hmm. they will be in the I have jazz one here, archives. Right Ooh, here, yeah. right there. So, um, and uh, you know, I always say you're my favorite storyteller ever, but I love it. One of the things I love is when we get together with Jim and Roger, and I know today's gonna be the same, just the stories, the anecdotes. And I know Bill Crow, his name is always, since I've been singing Top jazz, of the list. around yeah. Roger and, and Jim and Chris and everybody, they'll quote stories from one of his books. And I think, how cool is this? So he's on with us tonight. So shall we bring him on and chat? We shall. Him? We should. All right. So first we have our drummer friend over here, Jim White. Mm -hmm. Hi, Jim. Hey there. How are you doing? Hi. We yeah. have a um, bass player, Bee Gees bass player, good friend of ours, Roger Spencer. Hey, Roger. Hey, Raj. Cheers. And please help us welcome Bill Crow. Hi, everybody. Hey. Hello. Hi. Cheers. 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 <laughs> <laughs> mm. What's everybody drinking this evening? Um, I see a variety of things. Right now, I have a sparkling water. <clears throat> I'm going to be um, turning to something else <laughs> in a few minutes. <laughs> okay. When I turn into the bartender when I leave. There yeah. you go. Yes. Yeah. Cool. Bill's having a refreshing beer. Roger, are you having your special mineral water? Yes, this is uh, Swedish mineral water tonight from oh, yeah. uh, Absolute Martini. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And I'm just having a nice uh, Pinot Noir, mm. Uh, mm. some wine tonight. So uh, it's so great to to be with you all. And of course, I've, I've known BG and, and Roger and Monica for a very long time. And, and, and Bill, I got to say, it's just such a great pleasure to uh, to get to meet you here tonight and get to to see you. I've heard you're playing for so many years, and uh, I, I appreciate you contributing to 
uh, uh, the, the Mel Lewis book, The View Behind from the Back of the Band. That was one of my students. And he said, how wonderful you were, full you were in contributing that. So it's so great to be with you today. Oh, that's so, so cool. Here. It's almost as good as going to Charlie's Tavern. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and uh, this is the first time I'm meeting Bill, <laughs> sort of face to face. I've known about you forever. And I just say, uh, as a young player, I was inspired by your career and the vast majority of the things you did. And I wanted my career to be like your career. And I, I, I kind of got close. I got kind of a Bill Crow light career, but <laughs> I think I came by about uh, 15, 20 years after you and things were starting to dry up by the time I was getting into the business. but got to do a lot of the things that I dreamed about doing based on hearing you on recordings. <laughs> yeah. huh? well, everything's dried up now with the <laughs> Yeah. No yeah. Well, that's kind of how this started for anyone that's just coming about, you know, we're not working obviously, and we're not doing the online concert thing. So this is just a way to one, stay sane or a little more sane. And, mm -hmm. um, to stay in touch with people, you know, it's just a creative yeah. way to, to, to be in touch. So connect to fans and, um, and all of that. I was thinking about with, with all of you, I know BG has worked with you once and that was kind of within itself the same. Um, you all are just kind of one degree of separation from each other though. I mean, you've mutually worked with a lot of the same people over the oh, years. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, a lot of jazz people, we talk about that. And I, well, I listen as you guys talk about things like that. I love that. You know, it is a pretty small communi community. It's a family, but it's a nice family. Yeah. Yeah. Are you in New York? Is that right? Yeah. I, I live about a half an hour north of New York in Rockland County. Oh, OK. OK. Are you are you in most of the time or? Well, these days, I haven't been going in much at all. I used to go, I, I was working at Local 802 three days a week, besides mm -hmm. playing jobs at night, you know. But uh, the union is closed now, and uh, all of the jobs are gone. Yeah. So I think I've played one, uh, two, two nights uh, at an outdoor restaurant on Broadway a couple of weeks ago. That was nice. Oh, cool. A piano player and a singer than me. And uh, I drive down to a friend's house in New Jersey once in a while. I'm going down there Sunday. And uh, uh, a drummer named Nick Schubel and his uh, daughter, Leona K. Schubel, she's a coming piano player. Hmm. And so uh, we set up out in his backyard, eight or 10 feet, uh, feet apart, and <laughs> wear our masks and play. That's cool. That's that sounds cool. great. That's cool. Jim, what are you doing to, to stay in shape and just stay involved with everything right now? Well, I've uh, been spending an awful lot of time with my little boy, yeah. Oliver, and Ollie, we call him. And he's uh, it's been amazing because I'm, I'm getting a late start at this fatherhood thing. And, uh, but it, it's, it's fantastic. He's going to be three in December. And he's a, uh, he likes to listen to music, thankfully, as much as I do. And his, uh, his favorite cat right now is Papa Joe Jones. So wow. he, he wants to check out Papa Joe and, and he loves Count Basie. And so he, we've been listening like repetitively, clap hands, here comes Charlie, uh, but which we've aptly retitled uh, clap hands, here comes Ollie. <laughs> so, so uh, yeah, so it's been uh, uh, just so great, you know, spending time with him. And so in, in that case, it's, it's kind of been a, a blessing. On the other hand, you know, being a, a teacher, you know, I'm trying to figure out how what that's going to mean adapting to, you know, the online teaching and, and trying to, you know, have a multiple camera thing you know with the drums so you could be able to see some different angles and uh you know and then i've been trying to record remotely for for people that have asked me to send in their stuff 
uh, are sending tracks for them, which I'm not really a big fan of the, you know, Brady Bunch type put together, you know, that's just not how our music is played, you know, but uh, I've done some of it and, uh, you know, uh, but I've realized, you know, I used to just worry about playing the drums, which is enough for me to try to handle, but then now, you know, I gotta be the engineer and then, yeah. and then everybody wants like a, a video now that you can sit in. So you're kind of the videographer and uh, <laughs> I just can't, you know, I'll record a take and not turn on the record on the, on the whatever recording device. And so it's, yeah. it's been a lot to wrap my head around, but I'm, you know, trying to stay busy doing that and certainly listening to a lot of music, you know, it's yeah. been great to, uh, listen to a lot of records. I've been listening to a lot of Bill's recordings, of course, just getting ready for this and, uh, you know, getting excited about getting on here and getting to, uh, getting to see and talk to you, Bill. So great stuff. It's so nice just to see people see faces, you know, yeah. uh, we're still in quarantine. So this is like our interaction unless we wave at someone out the window or something like that. So it's wild. Yeah. Well, you can tell your son that uh, Joe Jones was one of my heroes too. And uh, when I finally got to New York and got to meet him, I was, uh, I was thrilled to pieces. And I actually got to play with him a couple of times and even made a record with him. I, yeah, I was looking at that, checking that out. Well, you played with so you just played with all the, the absolute greats, you know? Yeah, I was lucky. I got plenty of my drummer questions, but I'll I'll let Monica if she grants me the you know wishes, then I'll oh. maybe ask you some of those a little bit later. <laughs> no, no, no. So here, no, ask away. Listen, this is a happy hour. We don't have a format. We just <laughs> we just let it go, you know. So <laughs> just pretend like we're all sitting around a really cool hotel lounge bar or something, and eating some you know stale cocktail nuts and okay. Add just go at it. Well, well, you mentioned, you know, what I've been doing, the quarantine and staying sane. And at the beginning of the quarantine, one of the things that was that was really helpful, trying to figure out how to teach uh, online, it originally started as a way that drummers could try to figure out how to teach their students remotely. And then the group kind of got bigger. It was put together by Rich Thompson, who teaches up at Eastman, and then uh, uh, a great drummer, Carl, Carl Allen. And then it was kind of had a nucleus of guys that would meet on Zoom on Tuesday nights. And then it just started growing and growing and growing. And so now, you know, the regular people are uh, like Billy Hart has been there, which has been amazing. And Victor Lewis and uh, Kenny Washington, Joe LaBarbera, Jeff Hamilton, Matt Wilson, a bunch of guys. And so we are all, you know, talking about our favorite recordings and, and that stuff. And it's really been uh, just great fellowship to get together with all of these great players and learn a lot. And, uh, you know, I, I pretty much just sit there and uh, I don't say too much because <laughs> I could, even if I had anything to say, I'm one of the younger guys. So even if I had anything to say, I wouldn't be able to get it in a word edge wise with all these drummers. <laughs> <laughs> but, but there's been a couple of names that came up, have come up recently and one of those drummers that everybody is so fascinated with is O.C. Johnson. Really? And because there hasn't really, for all the recordings that he made in a relatively short amount of time, almost 700 recordings, uh, and we all have favorite records that he's on, there, was, uh, there hasn't ever really been much uh, research or uh, uh, information about him. And Bill, you. your name... Your name came up as being one of the guys that, uh, well, you obviously recorded with him on that Street Swingers record with Jim Hall and Jimmy Rainey. But we, we were wondering, uh, you know, I was just wondering if you might be able to talk about O.C. Johnson a little bit. Yeah, sure. Uh, uh, O.C. came to town. Um, uh, he, he was friends with Milt Hinton and Panama Francis and some of those people. And uh, the recording thing was just starting to bloom in New York. And, uh, uh, I think it was Milt invited him to come along on a, on a record date he was doing so he could see how record dates went, you know. And uh, O.C. sitting over in the corner and 
I forget who the, it's probably in one of my books. I forget who the, the act was that was recording, but the, the, uh, the thing was swinging so hard that at the end, before the red light went off, O.C. said, oh, yeah. And, and <laughs> anything, you know, but, uh, but the guy <laughs> sounded so good, let's leave it on the record. So, so they gave O.C. a, a W-2 form to fill out, you know. <laughs> <laughs> he made it, that was his first record date. Wow. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> that's beautiful. That's beautiful. Oh, man. <laughs> Yeah, well, he, he was great to play with. He 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 was the the number one drummer. He and Milt and Hank <coughs> were the 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 first first call mm -hmm. section. They would call those guys and find out what their availability were it was before they would book a studio. You know, to see if they could get them. And and of course things were so busy in in the sixties, late fifties and early sixties that they were recording after midnight at time and a half and all that just because they couldn't get the studio space mm -hmm. uh, everybody was recording it was really wonderful i i was on the road a lot in those days so i didn't pick up a whole lot of it but if you came in town and put your number with radio registry they would call mm -hmm. you for dates you know mm -hmm. so uh, uh i did get a chance to play a lot of it was commercial jingles i played with oc just, mm -hmm. uh, but he just put such a nice feel into whatever he did it was really nice and um uh, uh, recently i did something with bernie purdy and oh. i can play on a lot of records <laughs> but, uh this is the first straight ahead swing that i had played with him it was a thing for a uh, public television and I, I thought right away oh well, this guy sounds like oc you know he's got that same i never thought of that but you're right wow feel, you know yeah I got to, to work with um, Bernard one afternoon in one of the festivals at uh, in Columbia. I think it was the last one they had. Uh -huh. And I, you know, they would, they would, uh, it was almost like fielding a ball team because they'd, they'd have like three or four piano players and three or four bass players and so forth. And yeah. so somebody would put somebody together, especially the, the ones in the afternoon when it was really uh, informal. And so, I got Michael Moore on bass, I got Bernard Purdy, and I got uh, Lou Tobacken and uh, Irby Green. Wow. And me. <laughs> and I knew Bird, uh, uh, Bernard Purdy's rock, rock and roll stuff, but yeah. I, didn't, I didn't, had never heard him play just a regular set with, you know, and he just swung us right out the front door. You know, it was just so much fun. Wonderful player. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's funny. There's a uh, there's a good piece of uh, film that I think is on YouTube. Uh, it's it's popped up a couple of times on Facebook uh, of one of those concerts that we did in Columbia. Mm -hmm. uh, it was the the year that we discovered Chris Potter. Uh, oh yeah. They had a lot of high school groups playing on the street corners during the mm -hmm. day to try to drum up business for this thing at night. You know. And uh, I'm out walking around listening to all these kids, and I hear Chris. I thought, "What? Well, this guy is an ace player. What's he, He's amazing. What's he doing in high school? You know, <laughs> so he's graduating that year. Yeah. And I went and got Red Rodney and took him down. I said, listen, listen to this kid.' And Red says, "Oh man, why don't you come and play with us tonight?" So he did. He, he uh, Billy Watrous and Red and me and uh, Eddie Soff and Derek Smith. And uh, and he just tore it up. He sounded so good. Oh, so, yeah. man, if you ever come to New York, look me up. I can use a tenor player in my group, you know. And he said, well, I am coming up there to study at the new school. And so he, I don't think he stayed at the new school more than two, three months before Red grabbed him and took him on the road. And the next thing <laughs> I know, and, you know. Yeah, he's a monster. Wow. Chris is Fantastic. Yeah, I think the first time I met Chris was with uh, with uh, with Jim Ferguson, who was one of the first guys that I right. met when yeah. I moved to Nashville, which was in uh, moved from New York to Nashville in 1995. Oh. And, uh, so uh, and of course, I'm out in Colorado now. I've been teaching out here for a number of years. Uh, but uh, uh, yeah, Jim did a couple of his first records. Uh, Chris played on and 
uh, you know, we remain friends and I always have a great time playing with them when I can. So. Yeah. Yeah. Jim was, was kind enough to bring a couple of bases up to Columbus, Columbia there so that I didn't have to bring mine down. I, the, the night that I met Chris, I think it was the first, um, first time he'd been on the, the, um, Columbia thing. And Sounds like we, the same year. Hmm. It sounds like the same year. Could well, it could be. But he, I think he was there more than once. I'm not sure. Um, that could be apocryphal. Um, but I was working with a singer, and she was from um, Houston, I think. And um, wonderful singer, Jeannie something. I have lost track of um, who she was, but she was a, a mainstay around. Uh, where she was from in Texas, really beautiful woman and uh, very salty. She was kind of like a um, a grandmother or something, you know. She and she she knew songs for days. So we were fielded again. Uh, I think Jim Ferguson was playing bass, and uh, um, Chris came in and just did some solo things. And we were all knocked out with his age and everything, and. Uh, so when we got through, we were packing up to go to the next thing, and Jeannie was hanging out and putting her book together and everything. And she said to Chris, when he was putting his horn up, she said, kid, you're wonderful. You're just wonderful. How old are you anyway? And he said, I'm 21. And she said, 21? I've got underwear older than you are. <laughs> <laughs> and that was my... <laughs> my introduction to him and, and to her really. And uh, I saw her one time later in uh, Houston in a club and uh, Wilfred Brimley was sitting at the bar. I went up to get a drink and I, I looked at him and he looked at me and I said, are you Wilfred Brimley? And he said, yes, ma'am. And uh, he said, I love jazz. I come here all the time. <laughs> and he had come to hear her. And so we had a little reunion there for a minute. It was, it was fun. Right. Yeah, you didn't he record it? Hmm? I was say, didn't he record an album with Hamilton? Yes, he did. Yeah. Hamilton, yeah. That was what Milt Hinton's lines he used to use. I got shoes older than you. <laughs> 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 oh my goodness! Speaking of anecdotes, we we I think we have the second one, isn't it, Monica? We do. This, this yeah. is the first one. Yeah. And, um, I well, read all three is, of them, but it's just they, the first one with about a hundred more stories added. Oh yeah, uh, they no. wanted to do a, a rehash of it, and uh, yeah, that well, I've got, I've I've collected some more stories since that one came out, so let's add them. You know, yeah, so, cool. That's a good so one. I've read all three of them over the years, and then I couldn't. Um, we looked on Amazon, and we couldn't find uh, one of them, but we got the other two. This is the original, right? Yeah, and uh, so it's just every time I've <laughs> read any of the things in here, I, it just it tickles me because I think first of all that um, music is uh, jazz music and jazz musicians are the funniest people in the world. Yeah, they've yeah. always got a punchline if they need it, you know. And uh, it's funny how that got started. Uh, 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 when I got involved with the. Uh, uh, the, um, the the board that uh, I ran for for a spot on the board at Local 802, uh, we had a, a revolution there. Everybody, we threw all the old guys out, and uh, John Lazell became our new president, and and I was on the board. Mm -hmm. and, uh, that just meant coming in for a meeting once a week. It was no no big deal, but. John said to me, uh, why don't you write a column for the, he knew I wrote a little bit. He said, why don't you write a column for the, the monthly paper? And I said, I, I know exactly the column I want to write. I said, every time musicians get a chance to talk to each other on a gig, they start telling stories on each other. Mm -hmm. And somebody always says, somebody should write these down. I said, let me be the guy, you know? <laughs> yeah, the That's first, great. Uh, first couple of months, I just wrote stories that I remembered, either things that had happened while I was there or stories people had told me. And I got columns out of them. 
and everybody got the idea immediately and I started getting letters and emails and all everybody telling me their stories you know so that went on let's see I started that in 1983 and I'm still doing it and I haven't had to go looking for stories yet you know I yeah pick yeah. up things off the internet now uh, more than because there's no place to hang out with musicians yeah. uh, uh, it's amazing I got stories from all over the world uh, guys uh, found my column and, and enjoyed that so it was the column that got me the the deal with with oxford university press one of the vice presidents there was a jazz fan and uh, he asked he had gotten a bunch of jazz writers to write for him gene lees and ira gittler and some of those people mm -hmm. uh, and he he knew that uh, oxford had published anecdote collections from the opera and from the military and from literature and he said why shouldn't be, there be one from jazz you know so he asked his writers who would be a good person to do this and because of my column they all pointed at me so he called me up and we made a deal i got an advance and started putting all of these stories together and that was the first issue of jazz anecdotes and I realized when uh, when I was getting it into the final form that all my personal stories had a little different character to them. So I saved those out. And when the first book was successful, I called the editor up and I said, I think I've got another book. And that was from Birdland to Broadway. That was more. That one I remember too, yeah. So that was how come I got the second book written. <laughs> That's great. Well, it's, you, you should keep doing it. <laughs> Get a fourth one. Well, it's, they're I, wonderful stories. I don't, you know, it's a lot of work to do a book. Oh, yeah. A couple of yeah. years to do each one. Just you keep revising it and revising it until it seems right to you, you know. Mm -hmm. A couple of them, uh, they're, even though they're great stories, they turned out to be apocryphal in the end, like the famous Red Kelly story about yeah. sitting in a poodle. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, people still. <laughs> people still <laughs> Uh, would ask him about that uh, even even after I'd put that spilling the ink on the floor. True story. Yeah. <laughs> I'd, I'd heard that story forever. Did you ever I know a, a, a pianist named John Bannister? That sounds familiar, but I don't I don't place him. He was an LA cat that I knew out there, and and I got some great stories about him. Uh, he he was known for uh, his wit and quips. And one of my favorites is, uh, you remember Buddy Clark, the bass player? Oh, I knew Buddy. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I knew Buddy really well. And uh, I knew him when he fell off the hang glider in Los Angeles and broke every bone in his body. Oh, dear. He was, mm -hmm. uh, he was in the hospital in a coma for two months. Wow. Good grief. And a bunch of the guys got together and decided to do a big band concert at King Arthur's, which was a big band club out in the San Fernando Valley. And John Bannister is playing piano, and they're doing a fundraiser for Buddy, who's in the hospital in a coma. And the way the bandstand is situated, the piano is right by the entrance, kind of like Dante's was. You know, you walk in, and there's that walkway. Everybody sees her, but it comes in. But Bannister is right by the doorway. And uh, somebody walks in and, you know, pays their donation for Buddy and leans over to Bannister and says, is, uh, is Buddy going to be here tonight? <laughs> The banister turns around to him and says, he might drop in. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. Uh, oh, man. Yeah, well, some, Al Cohen was like that. He was quick. Boy. Oh, was he ever? I saw him coming out of Charlie's Tavern one night, and he was starting to grow a mustache. And I said, Al, you look like a cross between Groucho Marx and Emilio Zapata. <laughs> and he, he taps the, the, the ashes off of an imaginary cigar and says, Gaucho Marx. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Jake Hanna, too. He was great. Oh, Jake was wonderful. Oh, yeah. 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 One of the, I yeah. think this was Al Cohn that um, went by the um, recording studio when Mitch Miller was doing a bunch of stuff uh, back in the those days sing along kind of days and um, they saw all the the um, mandolin players going in the front door do you know that one yeah <laughs> he 
He said, I bet you. He just looked at it. They were all going in to do this thing and said, uh, I bet you can't get a haircut in Jersey City all day. <laughs> <laughs> that was funny. Jake, Jake told me one time he was, uh, I think it was at one of those jazz parties out there. Everybody's in the bar and, uh, and uh, he walks in and, and orders the bartender comes over to see what he wants. And uh, he says, I'll have a scotch, whatever it is. And, uh, and then the bartender brings him his drink and he says, and give everybody else a taste too. And so the bartender offers the drink around to everybody. Else. <laughs> 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 oh, yeah. Like Dave Barry says, you can't make this stuff up. He's, I'm no. a big fan of his. And that's that's one of the, the tried and true things. If you people come up to you that aren't musicians and say the damnedest things. Oh yeah. You know. And um <laughs> a lady came to me one day up on the bandstand in a little club and she said, Do you play by chord or by note? <laughs> and I said, What? <laughs> and she got really shirty you know because i didn't know what she was talking about yeah she said i said you know do you play by chord or by note and i said both i guess i don't know and i said i'm still scratching my head on that one that was like 40 years ago yeah. i have no idea what she meant the guys <laughs> woody's band told me one that they they were on the road and uh, the manager had filled in some night uh, at a place that really wasn't a jazz club. It was just more for, like, for dancing. And, mm. but, uh, you know, the, the uh, Woody says to his manager on the phone, what the hell did you book me in a place like this for? And he said, just get the money and go on. You know, we're, we're just trying to pay the salaries, you know, don't worry about it. So Woody's up there kind of going through the motions and he feels a tug at his pants leg. <laughs> a little lady down there say, "Do you know feelings?" You know, <laughs> and he says, "No, we don't know it." And, uh, and about two minutes later, she's tugging at his pants leg again. And says, "I want you to play feelings." And he says, "I lied to you. We do know it, but we don't want to play it." <laughs> <laughs> she says, "Do you know who I am?" He says, "No, but I know who I am." <laughs> oh, good for you. <laughs> That's funny. I, was, uh, <laughs> I, I went out to the Carnation Pavilion at Disneyland where Woody's Bane was in town. An old friend of mine was playing bass, and Jeff Hamilton and I drove out there to hang out near the band. We're sitting together, just the four of us, with Woody at a table on the break. And the intermission's over, and it's time to go back. So the, the whole band goes back to the stage, and Woody's just sitting there talking with us. The whole band's warmed up, sitting there waiting, and Woody's just sitting there talking with us. And you hear the announcement. You know, the Disneyland big announcer voice comes over. Boys and girls, ladies and gentlemen, the Magic Kingdom is proud to present Woody Herman and his thundering herd at the Carnation Pavilion for your dancing and listening pleasure. And Woody's just sitting there with us. <laughs> Finally, he pushes himself up out of the chair shuffles over in front of the bandstand and, and leans into the microphone with all these people and says, I'm too old for this shit. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Woody. I've got a Woody story that is, is really kind of out there. Um, when I was doing a lot of jingles when I first came to town, in, in studios, there was a, a violinist. Her name was Ingrid Fowler, and she was Woody's daughter. We didn't find it out until she finally told us that she was Woody Herman's daughter. And um, she was a, a fiddle fiddle player, violinist and fiddle. She did a lot of bluegrass things. She was very talented. And um, so she called me and my husband one day, one afternoon. We'd worked together some things, you know, little jingles and stuff. And she said, I've got a surprise for some of my musician fans. My dad is in town with his band overnight. And she said, I went down to the Station Inn, which was a bluegrass club, 
and ask them if they'd like to have a 18 piece band tonight and guest artist. And she knew all the fiddle players and all the, um, you know, bluegrass people. And her dad was like, sure, we'll do it, you know. So we all gathered down there, just a whole bunch of jazz fans and bluegrass fans and everything. And a um, couple of the stars of the bluegrass world, um, one of them, Johnny Gimbel, the fiddle player, uh -huh. really, truly wonderful player, but totally, totally bluegrass. And so he and Woody put their heads together and, and Woody was such a quick study, you know, he'd say, you know, run that by me one more time, and then we'll play. And he would play on clarinet the same thing that the bluegrass players were playing. And he had his whole band there. And he footed the bill and everything. It was kind of just for his daughter. <laughs> and all the guys, like the trumpet players and everybody were like, what time is it? I need a beer. What, what the hell is going on here? Because they were playing in this huge bluegrass band. And it, it worked. And uh, it was just a thing. You know, we had a marvelous time. They, they played for about three hours. Uh -huh. And the soloist would swap, you know, like a fiddle and then maybe um, saxophone or something. Mm -hmm. It was just totally off the cuff, and it was a really nice, nice night. Wow. So do you guys have a favorite anecdote, a favorite story that you have heard? Is there one that stands out? That's Oh, there's so many of them. Yeah. It's like saying, which which song do you like best? Yeah. Yeah. Which, which, which child's your favorite kind of thing? <laughs> Roger tells a story that I really like. I would like you to tell when you were playing in a society band and um, the drummer was not cutting it and the old man comes down and on their break and crawls around on the floor. Do you know that oh, one? That, that was Lori's uncle. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. That's even closer. But the Charlie, line, Charlie Gale, the, who actually... The is great. A, after, after you, sometime after you, played with Claude Thorne here for a while. But... Uh, <clears throat> The drummer was not happening on this uh, on this gig, and Charlie was quite the character and prankster. And they finish the set, and Charlie puts the bass down, and he gets down on the floor, and he's like crawling around on the floor and patting the carpet and scraping the carpet. And the drummer looks over the kit and says to him, "What are you looking for?" And it, Charlie says to him, "One." <laughs> 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 that's that's one that I I, I heard recently uh, when uh, this oh, I think it was Gene Denovi he was he was playing with this uh, band on the road and uh, their trombone player got sick or something happened that they had to pick up a local guy and they got a recommendation from the local union or something like that and they get this guy. <laughs> He's an ace. Never do that. And a, and, a, and a wonderful lead player, but he can't play any jazz at all. He just doesn't even know what it is, you know. So, and they open up with a, uh, I think they were accompanying Anita O'Day or somebody like that. Mm. But they open up with a, a, a Tiny Khan was the drummer. And they open up with a tune that he had written the arrangement of, a, a real bebop tune. And, uh, uh, the uh, uh, Gene tells this trombone player, "Well, uh, uh, the 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 chord the chords changes are the same as the, the tune whispering. Mm -hmm. So you know, so when it comes to the trombone solo, all he does is stand up and play three courses of the melody of whispering. <laughs> <laughs> when he finishes, Tony Khan leans over to Gene and says." What ideas? <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh my gosh! Oh, Hilarious. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> hey Roger, what about the the Zoot Sims? I think it was Zoot the practicing. Oh, that's in the book. That's in Bill's oh, yeah, book. Well, <laughs> but that's just it. I mean, everybody watching right now will love that story if they haven't yet read the book. One of my favorites, you know, and. I, I don't have the exact verbiage correct, but it's it's the story about Zoot being fairly inebriated on the gig. You think? 
<laughs> comes up to him on the break and says, Zoot, man, how, how do you play so good when you're drunk? And Zoot says, I practice drunk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, one night they were playing at the, the half hour, Alan Zoot, and Zoot was pretty well into the into the third set. They would they had a system with the uh, with the bartender. Son, Sonny would hold up a, a glass, uh, a double shot glass of whiskey usually, and uh, and he would just stand there with his hand like this, and they would down the thing and just let go of it, and it would fall into his hand. No, so <laughs> a number of those Zoot was in pretty good shape, and the, yeah. the game was over. But Zoot is still up there playing, and everybody else is backed up, and they're on their way out the door. And Al looks around and says, Zoot, take off the red shoes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, my. This, yeah, this it's is, so much fun. This is my favorite thing. We sit around after gigs and, and tell stories. And for me, it's just learning. I don't really have many stories to contribute. But um, as much fun as it is to hear the stories, I have to say it's equally as fun to see the people you hold in such high regard crying because they're laughing so hard at the stories they're telling or the stories <laughs> they're hearing in the set. Yeah. You know, it didn't matter what happened on the bandstand that night. You could uh, go back to the green room or hang out at the bar afterwards and have that camaraderie, just telling oh, yeah. a story, enjoying it. So. To meet uh, Red Kelly. I've never met him. Yeah, he was wonderful. <laughs> He, he played on Woody's band for quite a while, but yeah. when he retired, he opened a bar in Olympia, Washington. Right. And uh, he found out while he was uh, working there that that uh, you could get on the ballot uh, for the local election just by having 25 signatures, something like that. Oh, God. <laughs> so. That sounds joke, like now. <laughs> that's a joke. He ran for mayor and... Uh, he his bar the girl that worked behind the bar uh he ran her as the secretary of state or whatever. <laughs> drunk that had come with the bar when he bought it that uh, <laughs> some other you know they all ran for office and, and yeah. he thought up all he's like one of his slogans was unemployment isn't working <laughs> <laughs> And, oh, that's funny! And, uh, oh. and it really, everybody laughed about it so much that they they uh, they ended up getting uh, uh, something like half of the the votes that the the people who actually won the election uh, got, and <laughs> they were so annoyed by the the foolishness that they uh, they did something about his liquor license, and he ended up moving from Olympia to Tacoma, and that was. Where he had his last bar. Oh, wow. That was a wonderful place. Uh, there was a sign up on the bandstand that said, "Go get famous someplace else and then come back." You know. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. You ever notice how many great stories seem to emanate from bars? Oh yeah. You think? <laughs> it's so it's a like truth, when, truth when, serum. When, yeah. Yeah, Joseph is no a Trump around New York. When he got thrown out of Charlie's Tavern, he was sitting on, on Broomore's tenor case outside and looking glum. And I said, what's the matter, Don? He says, I'm barred from bands and I'm banned from bars. <laughs> <That's Aww. great. laughs> I always joke with the trumpet player, Clay Jenkins, you know, uh, after we play and we're always hanging out, hey, having a little taste you know, uh, 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 tequila seems to be his truth serum. So I always, you know, try to buy him some tequila and then say, yeah, go ahead and drink this because I, I want to ask you about how you thought I sounded tonight. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we kind of have our little thing. Hey, Bill, oh I wanted to ask you, you mentioned uh, Tiny Khan. What, did you ever get a chance to play with Tiny Khan or? No, uh, I came here in 1950 and uh, Tiny was around, but I didn't have any opportunity to meet him. And then uh, about a year later, I was working with, uh, with Stan Getz and uh, mm. 
uh, I thought maybe he would hire Tiny again. He had been his, his drummer, but Tiny died. And uh, oh. I never got a chance to, uh, I never even got a chance to hear him play live, you know? Yeah. Wow. Well, I wonder, you know, uh, it's right. I mean, he was just so far ahead of his time as far as being a composer. And, you know, oh. I, do you know where any, do you know any place that has a, is there like a repository for his music anywhere that you I don't know? Anything? No. Okay. Yeah, I was just curious. If, if, uh, if there is anything, it's probably at the Institute of Jazz Studies out at Rutgers. Okay. Oh, okay. Interesting. Okay. Okay. So I'm one of the things we started doing um, several shows ago is letting fans know that we were pre recording these and giving fans a chance to ask questions. Um, would you all be okay if I threw some fan questions at you? Sure, as long as you don't ask, what's the capital of North Dakota? Okay, <laughs> done. I won't do it. Now, <clears throat> because we can edit this, because okay. we can edit this, if you don't want to answer it, you just say pass or that's stupid, whatever. Um, okay, these are in no particular order, but they're for some of you individually and some just whoever wants to answer. So okay. first one for Bill, um, what is, or what, who is the best big band you ever played with? The Jerry Mulligan yeah. Concert Jazz Band. Oh, yes. wonderful. Uh, yes, band. that was my favorite. Um, those afternoon concerts at um, Village Vanguard. Yeah. With them, with that, that was the best band I ever heard. Yeah. And that, that's and, one of my and they recorded it well at that that live at the Village Vanguard album. That, that, mm -hmm. that's the way that band sounded. Oh, we it was wonderful! That, recordings, but they they didn't have the spirit of that particular one. That yeah. version of Blueport, where uh, mm. Mulligan and Clark Terry trade trade the blues choruses with places yeah. and destinations. <laughs> <laughs> and quoting songs about destinations just gasses me. And you know that exchange went on for another maybe five minutes. Yes. Yeah. And yeah. The, the take was so long they couldn't figure out how to get it on the MP. <laughs> and so Jerry listened to it over and over again, and he found a place where they could snip uh, a little hunk of tape out of there and uh, make it short enough to, to it's, it's still a very long track. But the idiots at Verve threw the tape away. They didn't, they didn't oh. keep, you know. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. oh so crazy. The That's entire so the entire take doesn't exist anywhere anymore. Nowhere. Oh. Oh. oh my gosh. Yeah, I just that that particular recording. You know, you and Mel are like so hooked up, and there's so much fire right. and the joy. I, I mean, just as a listener, you know what I mean. It just, uh, you know, and and you know, with Clark blowing, I mean, and everybody's just so swinging. It's just so yeah. happening, you know? Well, it was a perfect band. It was, uh, it was the same band that uh, Buddy Clark and Conti were on when mm. they did the European tour and they took Zoot along as a, a, a guest soloist. But um, when we came back, when they came back, Mel decided to stay in New York. I think Brookmeyer was leaning on him. And uh, and Buddy and Conte went back home, so Clark and I joined the band then, and the band was really in good shape because they'd been touring, you know, and uh, uh, so it only took us a couple of days to break in and and get tight with the band, and uh, I was just so thrilled to play with Mel that way because there was n no no piano, no guitar, it was just us, you know. <laughs> wow. Well, I, I one other question about that. I you know for that recording of All About Rosie, you know, and at the time that that was recorded, you know, I mean, that music is so complex, you know, uh, to just even be played today. Well, you know? we, we rehearsed, and that was, that was at a time that the band was not working, but okay. we were rehearsing every wow. week. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so we would go up to Lynn Oliver's and, and rehearse every Thursday morning or afternoon. And, uh, uh, Jerry brought in this chart of All About Rosie, and we started to shed it, and we realized we had something here that was really tough, you know. <laughs> yeah. So we added some rehearsals, 
and we were going to play it at Newport. We had the gig coming up at Newport that year. Mm -hmm. So uh, we got it to, um, it was one of those things that if you got lost, you could never find your way back in because you're not playing with anybody <laughs> else in the, yeah. in the section. You know, it's all crisscross. Yeah. So we, uh, we really had to uh, throw down a lot of flags to keep our, keep our place and all that. Wow. And we finally had it. So we, we felt really comfortable about playing it. We were playing it well. And we went up to Newport and we set up and the wind came up and it's flipping our music. And we thought, oh man, all it, that's all it's going to take is for one page to flip and we're gone. You know? So we, we didn't play it at Newport. We, we called something else and, 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 but we did record it you know, on, on the next record day. Yeah. Well, that is just, and, and so would you maybe just talk a little bit as we're talking about that band and that record about kind of the hookup with Mel? I know you played recorded with so many different drummers, but you know, was there a special relationship with, with his uh, beat and you know, how you felt playing with him? Yeah. Uh, it's funny, you know. A lot of drummers, uh, uh, they'll get excited, and the and the and the tempo will come up a hair, or they'll be on the front end of the beat. Mel was always settled into the middle of the beat, you know, and uh, so I would kind of stay on the front end of that, and uh, and we just felt so good together. It was nice, uh, you know. He said to me one time, he said, you know, I don't like to cut what the brass section is playing. He said it makes them lazy. He said if you play all our figures, you know. So they they got they're they're strong enough that if they if they make the time themselves it'll really swing you know he says I like to play what the saxophones are playing <laughs> that sets up <laughs> sets up what the brass section is doing you know yeah uh, yeah wow that's that's fantastic he had he had a uh, certain symbols that had a certain sound that was just right for the sax section or. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so uh, that that combination was good for me, and then Clark came in with that huge bag of tricks that he had, and he was just oh, yeah. perfect for that band. It was funny. Uh, Clark and Nick Travis and Don Ferrara were three entirely different style players. You know, Nick had a yeah. was like a Joe Newman kind of a player, mm -hmm. and uh, and uh, and Don was out of the Tristano school. But as a section, they were all taking Nick's lead. They sounded so good together. And then Clark would pop out and play these little solo spots that he had and just invent marvelous stuff. It was, uh, couldn't, have, couldn't have been better. Then we had Brookmeyer in the trombone section and he, there was something about Bob that everybody used him as, the, as their sounding board musically. If you wanted to know if you were playing good, you didn't. You didn't look to Jerry. You looked to Bob, because uh, he he was the one that really radiated the purity of that band, you know. And, and Jerry had the had the star quality and and the, the brilliant soloist and all that. But it was really was Brookmeyer was was our lodestone. He was the one that that made that band what it really was, you know. And he'd also had given uh, uh, Jerry a lot of advice about who to hire and all of that. So uh, I see. Kind well, of a boss, you know. Did you know? Uh, you know, hearing that band and the way you guys were playing and listening to the writing of of Brooke Meyer and uh, uh, Al Cohn and uh, you know uh, and Bill Holman did a lot. Yeah. Uh, Jerry hired him to come to New York and. Uh, he had three three arrangers working, but Bill had the job of taking all the quartet and sextet stuff and expanding it to a big band format, you know. Yeah. Well, what's the, um, I was just going to ask you that, you know, when you listen to uh, more modern, I guess you could say, composers or, 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 or newer arrangers and stuff, I mean, was there something <laughs> special about uh, the rhythmic aspect of the writing of those guys? that just, uh, you know, you hear one of those charts and the way that it was played by you guys and there, it's, uh, you know, so swinging with the articulation and the lengths of the notes. Yeah. And so much uh, motion in the phrasing. And 
I, so much of that to me, I've just it seems to be uh, linked in with the actual writing that of uh, uh, you know rhythmic yeah. as much as it was. Yeah, uh, it really was. Um, yeah, it was. Well, everybody loved Al's writing, and and Al loved that band. And uh, it was funny when he came in with that uh, that tune. He called it Mother's Day, but but Jerry re renamed it Lady Chatterley's Mother. Mm -hmm. And uh, originally, uh, there's a section about two thirds of the way through that that, that the band hits a, a long held note. That was supposed to be the end of the chart. That was the way it was when he brought it to the first rehearsal. Really? And, wow. And Jerry yeah. said, Jesus, he said, that was just going so good, I hated for it to be over. He said, why don't you take it back and write a few more choruses, you know? So Al was kind of surprised, but he did. And uh, I'm glad he did, because that last shout chorus is just wonderful. Uh, it's so it's so great. And you know the 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 inter uh, the inner dialogue between the trumpets and the back and the you know trombones and the saxophones you know and how it just works together rhythmically in those backgrounds yeah. in that particular chart and is uh, uh, really knew what to do uh, about that that sort of thing too. Uh, he had a big influence on the yes. phrasing uh, of that section work. You know, well, and that, yeah, I, that kind amazing. of writing there, there's a there's a freedom and an obligation. When there's no piano yeah that's right and, and another nice thing about that band was that uh except for the the structured tunes like black nightgown which we just played exactly the way it was written if there was some blowing choruses uh jerry would like to take it back to the quartet where it would be the soloist and mel and i and jerry would be playing little backgrounds but instead of uh, uh on the quartet that was the way it was on the big band, when Jerry started to play some backgrounds, the rest of the saxophone section would harmonize what he was playing and it would become a riff. Yeah. And then Bob would think of something that would go nicely counter to that and he'd get the brass section to play in that. And so we never went on to the next written section until Jerry, he had a couple of little cues that he would play mm -hmm. or a hand signal or something. Then we'd go on to the next written section. So every time we played one of those charts, it was different. You know, there would be different riffs and different length of solos. And uh, so it, it kept the whole thing very alive that way. You didn't, you didn't start phoning your part in, you know. <laughs> yeah. yeah, beautiful. I've, I've always thought of music and um, art, to, at least in, in um, what we have now, that in the past two, three hundred years, uh, that it seemed like art and music would always change at the same time. So sure. when you heard, yeah. you heard a, a, a DBC um, thing like uh, Beneath the Sea or one of the uh, cathedral songs, um, it was like looking at a painting on the wall. Yeah. yeah. And so I always thought because there was no piano, which was that was my first introduction to hearing any kind of music that was written, jazz music, without a piano in the rhythm section. And what it allows you to do is free float, mm -hmm. you know, to the point where you don't have to, you're not tied to some set of chord changes necessarily. And all those guys in there, I mean, you and everybody else were superb players. So it, I, I've, thought about it as being in layers of sound rather than just a tonal thing going here and there. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it gave them more room to improvise. You know, they didn't have to stick to, they, they stuck to a, a sound and something that was written for them, but then they could go over and above and around and all that mm -hmm. to that kind of music. The thing that made this really like the best band of that sort that I ever heard was that they didn't stick to a melody or stick to a set of changes, except they really were. The changes were coming from different lines, different instruments, mm -hmm. and they'd all wind up in the same place. <laughs> and it was because they had played together so long and, and the initial things that were written by uh, Jerry and whoever else was writing 
um, they were just ephemeral, I guess is what I'm looking for. Mm. They, everybody was soloing, but nobody got in anybody's way. Yeah. You know, it was kind of, well, and it was just beautiful music. One of the things Jerry said to us when we first started rehearsing was, it was, uh, I want the core of this band to be the quartet. There you go. So yeah. our dynamic range is going to be from piano to mezzo forte rather than from 40 to triple 40. Mm -hmm. You can get just as much excitement making that move, but yeah. the lower, lower volume level, you can hear all the inside parts, and that's what I'm interested in. Yeah. So we went along with that, and uh, it was really uh, it was thrilling for me because I didn't have to stick to roots and fifths, you know. I, I could <laughs> melodic bass lines that that seemed to fit what the rest of the band was doing, and uh, uh, so that really kept it interesting for me. Yeah. So when Jerry wrote these charts and handed you a bass part. Was there much specific notation, or was a lot of just chord changes? Your discretion, because well, Sam Jones stuff. There's a lot of very specific stuff that he wants to hear. Yeah, uh, <laughs> it depended on the chart. Sometimes uh, it would just be chord changes. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes he would have written out a line that he wanted to match what he was playing. Right. Uh, and then, but that would just be for the first chorus. And then it would be changes, you know. Right. Yeah. Usually in the like the tightly written uh, parts. Well, Al Cohen was that way too. He'd write a line that, uh, see, this some only bass players know is that we change what's written constantly because it's what's known. <laughs> of course. And uh, and uh, uh, orchestrators so, don't write for bass. <laughs> uh, Al Cohen and Bob Brookmeyer would would write bass lines that I would play exactly what they wrote because it would fit the written part so well. Right. And they understood how <laughs> a bass line should move. Uh, see, uh, my feeling about a bass line is that uh, you want to be around the basic notes of the chord, but you, if there's a rich note or a, a, a note that pulls you into the next chord, it's nice if the bass player can play that note too, uh, because it reinforces it in, in the lower register, you know. <laughs> and and then I, I look for lines that lead from one place to another, so that it's almost like a melody. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, that's just uh, this. It's more interesting that way, you know. I, once once in a while, and Jerry said to me while we were playing with the quartet, he said, "What are you doing?" playing sevenths and, and sixths. He says, you're supposed to be playing roots and thirds and fifths, you know. And I, he said, I didn't know that that uh, you had you had a, a, a dibs on, on certain notes. I said, I just try to play what sounds like a good bass melody. So, <laughs> but it, it got me to pay attention to his backgrounds more. And when he, if he was like playing a descending line, I would play a descending line and try to stay a tenth away from him. Maybe like that so that it sounded like there was more notes than there really were being played you know? <laughs> yeah i spent some time playing with les brown in los angeles and he wrote a lot of his charts still at that point and i remember a couple of times saying to him you be nice to me or i'm going to play what's written <laughs> 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 so it's funny i did some subs on ralph flanagan's band one time and uh <laughs> I found him walking behind me and calling out note names. He had the bass parts memorized. Oh, oh my goodness. <laughs> and they weren't that great. You know? yeah. so I was glad that I was not permanently on that band. Well, I have another question, another fan question. Are you ready? This one's for Jim White. Jim? Uh, oh, no. You ready? I, I, I'm, I'm nervous. You should be. <laughs> okay. All right. I'll try. Take a drink. Take a drink. Take a swig. Okay. Here we All go. Right. <laughs> Jim, what did you learn during your time with Maynard Ferguson? Oh, yeah. Well. He learned what a high note was. 
I did. <laughs> no I did. And, 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 you know, main, it means hearing wasn't so great at that time. And he had two big monitors that were right in his, uh, you know, for him. And then I would be up on a, uh, a, a drum riser, you know, the band was kind of up on a riser. And so I was like, right. I would get his monitors, you know, coming right at me. Wow. And, uh, and mm. so, and it was amazing, you know, cause it, it was main art and I was, I, I'm so thankful because that opportunity for me, I was still going to school at the university of North Texas. And of course, Chris Brown, you mm -hmm. know, one of my heroes had, uh, had preceded me on the band being at North Texas as well. And so, uh, you know, they had an opening and I ended up graduating, but I left school a little bit early to go, to go join the band. And I think Philadelphia was the first time he played and, uh, and it was, it was just a, an incredible thing because I, I was kind of one of the last generation of guys to kind of have the experience of going to a music school like that and actually getting to go out on the road with a big band oh, with, yeah. a, with a leader, you know, and it was the first time that I had gone to Japan and all over Europe and played those, the jazz festivals over there. And, uh, and of course I, I learned a lot about, you know, Maynard's, uh, you know, his taste and what he, uh, liked. He talked to a lot of history, uh, on, on the bus, you know, and he, you know, told me how much he loved Frankie Dunlop's drumming. And of course, you know, I'm a, been such a big fan of, of his playing with both Maynard and of course, Thelonious Monk. Mm. Um, uh, but I think the thing that, you know, was, was always sticks with me is that when I came out on the, you know, started playing with the band, I had a, a drum solo, like on every tune, you know, like, <laughs> you know forever and i said man these cats must dig me man look check it out man they must really be digging this and it didn't take it didn't take too long to realize that they just were resting their chops <laughs> but but whenever i was you know I having to play drummer. play or, however i was having to play those the drum solos manner would always be off the side of the stage and he would always be watching mm -hmm. he would always be watching me and he was always like, uh, uh, you know, just incredibly uh, supportive and, uh, you know, I mean, there's some, uh, there's a lot of funny stuff that happened on the band. It just like any other big band stuff he learned from Kenton and, you know, uh, but oh, yeah. uh, it just the experience of traveling all over the world and actually getting to, to play with him and, and seeing yeah. him you know, at a, at a, a much older age, just giving 150% every night was just yeah. truly inspirational. Yeah. How many, how many dates a year did you have? Well, he, when he would go out, I mean, we would stay out for, you know, several months at a time and, and never wow. come, never come home. And it didn't yeah. matter if we were playing at a high school or if we were playing, you know, Dizzy's 75th birthday party in Germany or something like that he was Maynard was just ready to deal every night, you know, and he put yeah. it out there and inspired us to do the same. So to go out and play blue bird land and, and, you know, them introduce him and come out every night, you know, just to, yeah. that kind of gives me chills thinking about it. Oh, yeah. that's neat. A friend of mine was on Randy Brooks's band back in the forties and Randy prided himself on his high register. You know, he could play high. So they were playing up in Montreal, I guess. Is that where Maynard was from? Yeah. And mm -hmm. uh, uh, they had a they had a radio show during the day uh, to to promote the the gig that night. And so they went in and they they did a rehearsal first, and then they went out for a little lunch and came back to do the show. And as they're walking back in, my friend was a drummer. He's walking with Randy, and they hear somebody playing all of Randy's parts an octave higher. <laughs> and it's oh young, young Maynard. He's probably about 19, 20 years old. Oh, wow. On this studio band, you know? Wow. So, yeah. Uh, uh, Randy almost had a heart attack. <laughs> <laughs> he was, he was uh, you know, something else, you know? It's uh, 
uh, amazing. And we would have all, he was friends with so many different people, you know, so we would have like, you know, Timothy Leary show up. And wow. I remember one night, the, the, the great rock drummer, uh, Buddy Miles, who I loved growing up was, was there. And he, he just, he just knew so many different people from, you know, so many different uh, uh, genres and everything. And it was, it was really fun. Good. Cool. Yeah. That's great. Okay, Roger. Oh, no, <laughs> sorry. Please, please. No, please, please. I'm sorry. One of the things uh, also that I noticed with with you and Chris, you both you both were on Maynard's band when you got out of uh, North Texas State, but you both also studied with Eddie Sove. Yep. So I was thinking when you put the two things together, you get a really hell of a good drummer. <laughs> you really do. <laughs> you were prepared when when Maynard came to call. As I understand, he always used to look for his people from North Texas State. Well, Ed, time, you, you, you both know, you know, Ed, and Ed is such a, his first year at North Texas was my freshman year at North Texas. So uh, really? it was an incredible benefit for me going there. And, and it was difficult at first because I, I never had a teacher that was uh, as tough as Ed was, uh, you know, which was great because I needed that, Yeah, you know, yeah. but when F, uh, you know, when Ed would, uh, you know, he would just tell, tell it like it was and, uh, you know, which was great. And uh, I think, you know, he taught so many different drummers that all play completely different. But mm -hmm. the one thing that he really taught us is to, you know, trust in what we're doing and to believe in what we're doing, you know. Mm -hmm. And I remember I was playing in the two o'clock band there and I was really uh, struggling at the time. And Chris actually played in the two o'clock band for a while, too. And we share stories about it. But uh uh, the person that was leading the band just didn't really dig my playing. We were playing a lot of bassy stuff and, and uh, you know, he didn't like my cymbals was telling me I need to put tape on my cymbals and all this stuff. He just didn't really dig me, you know, and uh, <laughs> which was fine. And then I, I was in there one semester and I got moved out of the band, but I remember going to my lesson one day with Ed and I said, you know, I said, I'm really frustrated because I'm checking out these records, you know, I'm trying to like, you know, really emulate what Sonny Payne was playing and Harold Jones. And, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, I thought Ed was going to say, well, you know what, man, you just, you sound terrible, you know, was going to continue to pile on, you know, and, and I remember him telling me at that time, he said, you know, the drums are one of the instruments that every musician thinks that they know everything about yeah and and he said uh you know you you rarely will hear me ask a you know a, a saxophone player if he could maybe try a new ligature you know because <laughs> you know his sound you know wasn't appealing to me or that if he could maybe try a different read you know yet people will say hey can you play this symbol or i don't like this but you know he had a way and you know for as a teacher of inspiring us to really uh, think for ourselves and stand behind what we felt, uh, uh, you know, how we felt like the music should go. And of course, come from that, from a knowledgeable place, you know, you have to do your homework. And, mm -hmm. uh, but I think he just is, uh, is one of those guys. He's a, he's a genius and he's my hero. You know, I mean, I have a lot of them, but I mean, he's, he was my teacher for so long and I'm so thankful that I get that from him. And I continue to stay in touch with him regularly, uh, to this day. So Ed, if you ever hear this, thank you so much for everything you've given all of us. Jim, you have to tell him that we're doing this. So I, I will, I will, I'll yeah. keep, I'll, I'll, I'll tell him. Hi Ed. Hi, yeah. Ed. Everyone say hi to Ed. He's <laughs> hi, Ed. Yeah. hi, Ed. I sure enjoyed playing with him on those concerts down there in Columbia. Columbia. Yeah, exactly. And, um, he always played with Clark Terry when they when Clark came. Yeah, yeah he did. It was really, really good stuff. It was just lovely. How many years did you do the South Carolina thing, Beach? Uh Three. Three? Three years. Bill, how many... How many times, how many years did you play it? Uh, two or three, I can't remember. 
Mm. So at least one year you guys overlapped. That's pretty cool. We do, we I don't know how long. I don't know how long the festival lasted. It sounded to me like a really cool festival. I wish yeah, it, was it, was, it was every. What was it? Memorial Day. It was. It was three days long. Yeah, yeah. And and they did the um, the restaurant that sponsored it was a big, beautiful um, sort of Greek. Um, Greek French restaurant. French, yeah, restaurant, and. They had um, concerts starting Friday nights, and then Saturday, all day Saturday. And they would walk off the street and use a the back of a semi truck for a stage. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, then on Sundays they really shut good. down a street. And the food was great. Oh mm -hmm. yeah, and it um, the Sunday one was the big deal. It started at noon, and you paid a ticket. It was like seventy five hundred dollars, but that meant total food the whole day until midnight, and open bar, no more money. You paid one ticket, and hmm. everybody kept people came from all over the place. Oh yeah, and um, you would go in anytime you wanted to into the restaurant, which opened onto the stage, and. You could have whatever you wanted. But the other thing they did was they, they involved the whole city. And so the banks, if you went into the bank to cash a check, everybody would have a little scarf on and something over here that says, yay for jazz or, yeah. you know, one of those things. And they can all be playing on the corners. Right. Movie theater starting at 10 o'clock on Saturday morning would do things like the biography of Thelonious Monk. Uh -huh. Or the history of Count Basie and all these things, everything in the in the whole thing, and they had the Chamber of Commerce in on this. They just made everything about jazz, and yeah. then they brought in six or seven trumpet players, six or seven alto players, several rhythm sections, and then they would just get up and say, "Okay, today, you you're going to play piano, you're going to play with this drummer, and you're going to play with." this bass player mm -hmm. and we got to meet all kinds they they recorded some of it and it's mm -hmm. on um, npr mm -hmm. i got to play with some of the most famous musicians that i loved and everybody else did too and That's i made amazing. really good contacts that festival got me on marion mcpartland's show oh yeah yeah mm -hmm. so and, and we formed a, a really good friendship mary and i did mm -hmm. and i had she had me on more than once <laughs> that she it was got, all because of that that festival yeah she yeah. got the old hickory house trio together uh one yeah. for one of yeah. our shows with joe morello yeah. oh, man. we we and, were having such a good time playing that uh, they just kept recording us and uh, when she got sick uh, her manager called me up and said, mm -hmm. Marion needs somebody to do the, the show, and we've got enough music left over from the time Joe was here. That, mm -hmm. uh, why don't you just come and MC the thing? So that's... Oh, nice. That was... Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Wow. I bet you have fond memories working with her. Oh, yeah. Well, that was my first really good job in New York. Uh, I'd been working with Terry Gibbs, mm -hmm. uh, but we'd be in the... Uh, on the circuit, you know, we do a week in Birdland and then Boston or Washington or Baltimore, Toronto, uh, you know, uh, sometimes East St. Louis. <laughs> mm. And uh, so then when I stopped doing that, I was just kind of bumming around New York, picking up a week here and a couple of days there. And, uh, and the phone rings says, Marion. Now, we had met uh, uh, Terry's quartet and her trio and Ama Jamal's trio had oh, done wow. a concert. <laughs> Not too shabby. Where I met her on, on that concert, and she had a chance to hear me play. So when uh, Vinnie Burke left her group, she called me up and wanted to know if I wanted to come. And it was like six nights a week for the next two yeah, years. Yeah. You know? wow. The Hickory House. She was lovely. There was no ego with her. Dizzy Gillespie called her everybody's favorite aunt. <laughs> and she was. <laughs> she was really dear, and she was so um, encouraging 
to younger musicians. She was really, really a nice woman. Yeah. And, you know, well, she lost this a little toward the end of her life, but in yes. the year I was working with her, she had the most phenomenal memory for oh, yeah. people that she had met. And it really tied her audience to her because it was just a personal. People would come up and say, oh, Miss McFarland, you probably don't remember us. Uh, we met you uh, three years ago down in Philadelphia. She said, oh, yes, and you had the, your ch children were named Bobby and, you know. <laughs> yeah. You would That's remember her. about them. It was just amazing. <laughs> Aww. Jeff Jeff Hamilton has that kind of memory. I'm always like, it's unbelievable who you know uh, being around him, or you know he'll meet people or see people, and he'll tell them exactly where he met him. He can remember every mm -hmm. gig. Yeah. I can hardly remember members of my own family. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but I mean, he's he's like has this uh, in you know uh, elephant like memory, you know. The opposite of that was Pee Wee Russell. He was drunk for about 25 years. And <laughs> when he finally got so sick that he had to stop drinking, I was working a job with him up in Boston. We're having breakfast at the restaurant downstairs. And these people walk in, and this woman just lights up and says, Pee Wee! And she runs over and says, Oh, so good to see you. And he got this absolutely blank look on his face. And she says to her, and her husband's right behind her, she says, he doesn't remember us. And he says, no. And she said, Pee Wee, you lived with us for six months in St. Louis in 1943. You know, he says, if you say so. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness.